Today's show is brought to you by Black Throated Mercantile Hats. Check them out on their Instagram or Big Cartel. From dead lot to your head, go get you one. Well, hey, Space Wranglers. Hope everybody's doing good. I got something a little different for you today. Uh, we're going to talk about Grateful Dead tapes. Uh, I was a collector back in the day. Uh, sadly, my entire collection is now gone to the four winds. Uh, but, you know, I didn't have a tremendously huge catalog of tapes. But uh, what I had, I thought was a pretty good representation of the band's music. And it was through that conduit of tapes. That is how I got deeply, deeply into deadheadness. Um, my little group of friends, we each had our favorite shows and, and between all of our collections, we had kind of one great big one. What I thought I was going to, when I set out to make this video, I, I thought I was going to make a list and talk about, you know, my list of favorite shows or whatever. I ran headlong into the fact that all the bangers in my collection, all the shows that I thought were, you know, belonged on a, on a yeah, crazy legs favorite list. Almost all of them are on 30 trips around the sun. <laughs> Uh, the Zenith show from 1990 in Paris, Oxford Plains in Maine, uh, the Miami Dark Star from 89, of course, uh, 91887 from MSG, and uh, October 1st, 1994 in Boston, from Boston Garden. All these shows are, are on 30 trips around the sun. And if you're not familiar with that box set, uh, in about 2015, The Dead put out this giant collection of shows 30 shows one show from every year of their career that was you know deemed by the curators um the best of that year and it's it's a really well curated selection uh of performances it's like 88 cds and it's pretty much unobtainium on the second hand market i i didn't have the wherewithal to get it then and i don't now <laughs> Um, all of those shows are on uh, the archive, of course, or, or re-listen, um, and uh, it's a great starting place. But I still wanted to put together a list of performances that maybe have slipped by people's attentions. And I realized this task was kind of beyond me. Um, so I reached out to Ed, who runs 31 Days of Dead on Instagram. And if by some miracle you found your way to my presence here on the interwebs and you're unaware of him, stop this, stop this video and uh, go seek him out. He posts almost daily on Instagram and uh, it's uh, always well written and it's very insightful. And I've learned um, something basically every time I've scrolled through there. So uh, I'd like to bring you my interview uh, with um, 31 Days of Dead. Um, I was going to chop it down and release it in small little bits, but um, it's about an hour long and the conversation kind of flows. We, we jump around a lot, which is totally my fault. Um, I was pretty animated and excited and um, I'm not the most systematic of amateur interviewers. So um, I apologies for that. But if you hang through to the end, um, I'm going to uh, post a, a nice complete list of the performances we talked about so that you can go out and um, have yourself a ball um, listening to some of these great dead shows. Uh, if you've made it this far into my uh, rambling monologue, please take a second and subscribe. Uh, we would love to um, see you back here, and that will ensure that we'll run into each other again here. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoy the interview. Great. Um, so I'm talking to Ed Martin. He runs the Instagram account 31 Days of Dead, which has 47,000 followers. It's uh, a spot I check regularly in my feed. And um, I've been a deadhead since, you know, early high school. And I'm learning stuff from Ed every single day. So I'm super excited to talk to him today. Um, Ed, thanks for taking the time to join us. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. So I'm working on a project um, about my favorite unreleased shows. And so when I say released, I mean just in the panoply of Grateful Dead releases, of live releases, going back to kind of what I consider like one from the vault, Dick's, Dick's Picks 1, kind of early 90s through the latest Dave's Picks. Sure. They, put out, they put out a lot of material. Um and I still think there's some there's some nuggets in there. And actually, your feed constantly points them out to me. <laughs> um, I, I like to 
Yeah, I like to think I know my way around the band's music, but there's so much out there still. So, um, what like what what springs to mind for you for stuff that that has that you can't run out and buy a CD of right now? Um, well, I, you know, believe it or not, there there's a, there is a lot. You know, I started getting discouraged when I was doing this project because I was like, well, they keep releasing all these releases, these official releases, and there's going to be nothing for me to do for my projects, but. Um, <laughs> But there, 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 there is. Um, so, for example, um, I just I, in '73 they've released a lot of '73, but um, there's a lot from February of '73 they haven't released. For example, um, the first show of the year, February 9th in Palo Alto. Yeah. Um, and then the Madison show from 2:15, and even on um, the St. Paul show 2:17, and the 2:19 show. So those are you know great shows from February. There. There is some representation from March of that year, mm-hmm. but um, really not that much from February. So that that seems like an area that is ripe to be released. Um, well, speaking of seventy three, the, so the one um, I, I I like I said I, I like to think I know my way around the catalog, but it's just just in the last year I read um, uh, Deadology by Howard Weiner, and um, he a great hit- writer. Yeah, it was such a great read. It, uh, the the um the way that he laid it out was really interesting, and the shows that he focused on was were really interesting too. The um the Polly Pavilion eleven seventeen seventy three that kind of the, the set piece of the play and Uncle John's do Uncle John's plan that came out three or four, or I guess six times altogether, but that's been released a handful of times. I'm wondering if you know of an, a, a version of that that's not in the official record so far. Ah, the play in palindrome, one of my favorites. Um, so I think uh, I think it was only played three times. Um, oh, really? One was at the Poly Pavilion on eleven seventeen, and then um, there's the Cow Palace on three twenty three, and um, I think the first one was actually at Winterland uh, really? eleven ten seventy three. Um, there was an almost one on eleven one, uh, but I think they missed. Uncle John's, I think it was uh, Morning Dew and playing the band, or they just did it in a different sequence, not quite the the palindrome. Yeah, but it was just those three times, and I guess actually eleven ten was released as part of the Winterland box set. So I think all of those have been released. Seventy three. My favorite dead. Well, I have a lot of favorite deads, but my favorite dead is dead. What I call dead in transition. So like, Pig Pen checks out. You have kind of like new songs in seventy three. You have Keith really kind of flourishing and. They're f- like they're firing on all cylinders and they're like young guys, too. You know, oh, there's the energy is amazing. Yeah. And it sort of happens. There's a reprise of that in 79 with Brent when he joins the band. Those Absolutely. rehearsals are incredible. Uh, and that fall tour is there's just so many nuggets on that that are that are um, really, really good. You know, absolutely. So, you know, one of the ones that I think that they could release uh, in 79 um, with Brent, I think they were really, as you said, firing on all cylinders by de- November and December of 79, um, things had really gelled together. Um, you can see it in the end of October with the, the Cape Cod shows. Yeah. Um, but in December is particularly, November, and December is particularly good. Um, there's a classic tape that I had and, um, it seems to be forgotten about. Um, but, uh, December 1st, 79, um, from Pittsburgh. Yes. Um, yeah, that's a great show. Right. I had that tape too. Yeah. yeah. So it's got a great He's Gone um, with a Gloria jam in there. So um, that that's one that, that could be released. It's got a nice jam. It's very similar, not, not similar, but, you know, the same way as um, 5681, uh, where the, the He's Gone just kind of takes off into yeah. uncharted territory. Um, let me back up a second. Did, were, were you a, a taper yourself or just as you trade tapes or have a large collection or what, what was your, your linkage to the catalog? I had a great collection. I had some great contacts. Um, I even had some people um, in Germany who had oh, attended wow. the, some of the Europe 72 shows. Huh. Um, and I had a great connection in Cincinnati. I actually met up with the guy at the Louisville show in 1990. Um, so I had some really good um, tape trader connections. Um, I'm not that tech- technically s- savvy, um, so um, I, you know, I, I didn't. I, I did tape a couple shows. There was a, guy, a friend of mine who was a taper, mm-hmm. and there was a run in Denver in 1990. He was not able to attend, which I was attending. So he gave me his tape equipment and said, "Just have at it." So we sat in the taper section, 
And that's a really cool experience. I think everyone sh should or should have experienced at least once in their lifetime. Um, yeah. It was a lot of fun. There's a lot of pressure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I could <laughs> imagine. That, um, I guess if you're used to it, um, the, you know, it becomes a lot easier. But I felt a lot of pressure. Like I really wanted to, you know, perform for him very well. <laughs> sure. Yeah. There was a really great. I'm a huge fan of uh, Valley Road. There was a great Valley Road in that run. Yeah, there was. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's fan. I taped. I, I had a similar, similar. I had, I had not a very deep. I, I was born in '76, so I was in high school in the early '90s, and uh, my freshman year at college was 1994. And I, I had a taper friend there. I got tickets to see this uh, group, Bad Hat, which was Tran Anastasio and a bunch of local guys perform at the local theater, and he yeah. gave me his tape deck. And I was in the front row and I set up the mics and like halfway through, I got, I mean, I, I had it rolling. I had the dad spinning and everything. And like halfway through the first song, somebody from the theater came over and was like, y you can't do this. Here. <laughs> so I had about 90 seconds of tape and that was, that was my <laughs> one foray into tape. Right. And I mean, I was probably 10 feet from the band. Like this was all, it was just like that rerun thing and what's happening, you know, with the Doobie brothers. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, at, at, at any rate, yeah, I, I, um, I collected tapes myself. I, they're all gone now. I've had to kind of re reacquaint myself with the collection or with the you know the Canada material. And I, I, really, the, the the reason I reached out to you was all of my go to stuff, all of the tapes that I wore out, almost without exception, are on thirty trips around the sun. All of my favorite shows, uh, nine eighteen eighty seven uh, mm. is is I think probably my may, may it's hard to say which is my absolute favorite, but. That's a favorite of mine. Uh, nine ten ninety one. That that had just happened when I was a sophomore, junior in high school, and we wore that tape out. I mean, that was a really you know latter day special show. I was at the Boston Garden ten one ninety four show. Wow, which I consider wow. really like the last great dead show. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll tell anybody that that will. Su suffer me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my opinion is. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah, so so it's, you know, I had probably 100 150 tapes back in the day, but they're all gone now and um so I'm curious about this this like unreleased trove. So 73. Okay, great. Let's um yeah, let's let's move on. What what are some other eras do you think are 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 uh, some other veins that are untapped? So, I don't think there's a lot of 87 out there. I know they released the um uh the Hartford run from yeah. spring of 87. But um, there's, you know, 87 was, it was kind of a, a, a really fire year. Jerry had just come back and the energy was there. He was healthy. Um, so, you know, there's, I, I, every year I never miss posting that, um, that Terrapin from, from Hampton where, you know, Jerry's doing the, uh, the windmills. Yeah. So yeah. you can see the energy. It's great to have video of that. Yeah. Um, but some of the other shows uh, from that tour that were great, um, the, the Centrum show from four four, mm -hmm. um, Ico playing comes a Willie, and then um, there's the Morning Dew that closes out. Just short show, powerful short show, similar to like nine eighteen, but very powerful. Um, yeah. And then in the summertime, uh, um, during the Dylan tour, they stopped and did a couple indoor shows, and to me, those are the ones. Um, the Roanoke show from July sixth. Uh, I'm sorry, the Roanoke show was July eighth. The um, the Pittsburgh show with the Neville brothers uh, yeah. set on July 6th, uh, just, you know, incredible energy. Um, certainly not a spacey show by any stretch of the imagination, but um, what a, you know, a great party uh, tape, just tons, gobs of energy. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Um, 82, uh, August of 82 um, is a great time for the dead too. Uh, eight, three, eight, 10. And, um, Obviously, the Frost show from Ten Ten, or even yeah. the you know that could be a box set. The 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 Fro the two October Frost shows Ten yeah. Ten and Ten. Um, yeah. I kind of made some notes about what I thought could possibly be some box sets in the future too. Oh yeah, let's um, hear it. So you know, there's, there's, there's three Winterland shows in um, March of '77. That that could easily be yeah. a box set. They're in good quality and they're great shows. Um, you know, the, on one of them, there's a full terrapin, almost full terrapin, um, and uh, a scarlet without a fire that just kind of reaches some amazing heights. There's a road Jimmy from 320. So 
there's some really good stuff that could be released in that box set. Um, another kind of interesting one would be maybe like a New Year's Eve um, box set of uh, from Winterland of 71 and 72. Those seem like they would be um, a nice complimentary set. Yeah, um, those are great shows. They put those on the Sirius. Uh, the, the Sirius runs those. I, I think I've heard of a few New Year's in a row, and I had never heard the 71 New Year's show before, and it's fantastic. Yeah, supposedly, from my reading of it, um, I think the show started on at midnight, and supposedly there was some guy, like, running around in a diaper as, as like the new year baby <laughs> during dancing in the streets it must have been wild but you can imagine the theme um but uh another one and i know um my good buddy um uh um from from the who has the the account from the lot um he loves the arc shows that, that for him that's it uh, from 69 those three shows would make a nice box set i'm not sure if the quality the sound quality is up to par with what the organs of the dead might want to release, but yeah. I, it, to me, it's good enough. And it'd probably be good enough for a lot of other people too, because April 69 was another great time for the dead. Um, and um, the Orpheum shows from 76, I know only 717 has been released. That's a great show that comes a time is, you know, for the ages, the, the, yeah. the outro jam from that. But, um, you know, 718 is a great show, and then 712 through 714 are also good. I think there might be some problems with sound quality. That's maybe why the hesitation. Yeah. Um, and then also, you know, uh, 1989, everyone knows that's, you know, the summer, especially into the into the fall. Great time for the dead as well. Um, I know Downhill From Here was released as a video. I don't think it's been released uh, as audio. Um, and that could make a great box set too. I mean, that's yeah, it absolutely show. could. I, the, the truncated, I know that that was kind of the trend at the time of, of doing those truncated edits. Uh, and it, it does flow well as a show, but both of those performances are standout. And I, I mean, I would say that, uh, I, I don't, I should have looked this up, but I don't know if Miami 89, the Miami dark star, if that hasn't been released, it really should be. Cause that's, that's it, it a was actually, it was on the, the 30 trips. That's another one that's on. Oh, it is. <laughs> yeah. I, that's the thing. Like, so you know, I was checking some of this stuff out. Cause I was like, wow, you know, before, before our, our, our call here. Yeah. Like, I got to check to see what's been released. Cause there's been so much released that. I'm yeah. Yeah. It. Yeah. The, a lot, a lot of the stuff that I really, um, you know, my dad is who got me into the dead. And, and I remember driving around the block several times with him playing him. It was either, I guess, 6, 10, 76, the, the Boston show that has Great this one. incredibly powerful St. Stephen. It's really my favorite, like, latter-day 70s St. Stephen. Uh, and I it, there, there was great circulating soundboards of that. And then that that is now a box set, which is oh, fantastic. Six, nine. Is, is that the one you saw? 6, 9? 6, 9. Season? Yes. So bus dad. Yeah. 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 It's really incredible. That yeah. June 76 um, was a wise choice for them. I think they really do make good curated choices with their releases, um, but they're, they're hammering through it. And I totally agree about 1987 that um, that year uh, the band was really, really in fine form and yeah. the playing was great. You know, a little underrepresented um, from 76. Another one that, that uh, would be a good, it's kind of an interesting show is 628 76, which has the happiness is jamming. Uh, happiness is uh, drumming uh, jam, which, oh, wow. is the, which is the embryonic version of um, Fire in the Mountain, an instrumental version of that. Wow. Um, I think that then goes into Eyes of the World, and I think there's a war frat. Um, that's a really interesting one. Another interesting one, um, I've put this on my projects a couple times. I always try and put things in my projects that I kind of like maybe give the dead, like, you know, Maybe they might listen to me, but I doubt it. <laughs> but uh, I always try and put things on there that I want them to release. Uh -huh. um, one thing I put on, and many things, in, in many ways, a lot of them have been released. I, I'm not going to say it's it's because of me. It's because they're just great shows, and they're they're releasing them. But um, one show I would love for them to release is 112078 from Cleveland. Um, short second set, but it's interesting. I think there's a um, like a, a playing shakedown. Um, if I had the world to give, um, which, you know, is a, a show, it's a song I love, um, and it was only played a few times. So, um, it kind of, and, and also what's interesting about that show too, is the second set opens with drums and then a jam, 
and then eventually resolves into um, Jackaro of all things. Oh wow! So huh. I love stuff like that. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Completely different. Yeah, you know? yeah. I I think that, so. It my uh, my old roommate and longtime listening partner. Um, it, it you know I, I I to go back to uh, nine eighteen eighty seven. Like at the morning, the uh, the dew is uh, transcendent. That the the, uh, the bird song at the first set is amazing, but the, it, it's not really like, like the novelty, but just sort of the zeitgeist moment of the good love and La Bamba. Like I was a kid then. We had MTV. They played the shit out of that La Bamba video all the time. That was in that was in the air, and it still makes the hair on my arm stand up when Jerry fells out. <laughs> it was it was really of the moment and of the time you know the movie was not that great but it was los lobos and that whole connection and it, it, it's um that's that's what makes that show stand out to me and they they just play the ass out of it you know absolutely i actually um was fortunate enough to be present at that show oh get um, out of here i was at the garden and um you know, I kind of had my wish list of things I wanted them to play, and I was uh -huh. like, trying to will them to play. And I want it Watchtower, and I want it Do, uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, and I want it. I you know, the, there was no internet back then, but there was Dupree's Diamond News. It was a little newsletter that would be circulated yep. around, and you'd sure. be able to see what the set list were. And it's like, oh my god, they're doing La Bamba. I was like, that's pretty wild. Um, and how would that work? And you know, so I had no idea because I didn't hear the tapes or anything how they were going to squeeze that in between. Good love and, and when they did it, of course, it made a lot of sense. And yeah, you're right. La Bamba um, was a song that was um, popular was, uh, at the time. It was on it was on the music charts, and so um, and the, the Dead, of course, were on the music charts also because Touch of Grey was um, right. popular at the time too. Um, so it was interesting. It was an interesting choice uh, for them to do that, and it's, it's also interesting they did it just in '87 and then they dropped it. Yep. So, so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was blown away by your post about uh 10 12 84 just the other day um that augusta show um is one i've been familiar with for years but i hadn't really revisited it i didn't know that famous kind of nefarious photo of jerry coming out of the hotel with his briefcase is from that <laughs> run of shows uh and um it really is something else i mean it's uh it, it, it that that's quite a performance it sure is. Um, it made it onto the 30 trips around the sun and Yet again, um, yeah. a good friend of mine uh, actually attended. That was his first show. He was going to school up uh, in New England and oh, wow. he made the road trip. He told me it was like it was like a gymnasium. It was so small and um, uh, and everything that you, you, you read about it, the comments from people um, is it, it, it aligns with what he was telling me, too. It's just it's just an amazing, really powerful, powerful show. I keep. Um, I keep sidetracking you. Um, what what else do you have on on your list of uh, of of things oh, that, yeah. that that you like or that you'd like to see released or uh, or just kind of like closet favorites? Sure, sure. I, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll run through my list. So also, um, you know, there could be some better Greek representation. There they played runs um, beginning in 1982. So the 82 run is great. Uh, the 84 run where they did the Scarlet Touch Fire and then the yeah. Star as the encore. Um, that that would be great. Um, they could do a box set just of that run, the the Greek run, uh, seven thirteen through seven fifteen. Um, that would be great. Um, also, the twenty fifth anniversary tour um, or twenty fifth anniversary shows at the Greek, uh, June fourteenth through sixteenth in eighty five. Um, the cryptical development uh, reprise um, or bust out rather. So th th those could be um, you know either individual shows or box sets. Yeah. Um, but another 89 show, you know, because since we're talking about 89, I know they've released a lot from 89, but to me, one they missed, I, it was a show I attended. Um, there's a great video of it, is um, 7 2 89 in Foxborough, where they open the show with uh, playing Crazy Fingers, Wang Ding Doodle. Yeah. And the thing I always like to com comment about is having been there, sometimes you catch things that you, know, you may not catch on tape. Uh -huh. um, after, the first set was incredible. I mean, it was just Slamey Dam was in there, um, just a, a lot of great songs uh, and very well played. And it, not notwithstanding the fact that they opened up with, again, playing Crazy Fingers um, and did To Lay Me Down, um, at the set break, everyone was looking at each other, high-fiving, like, how about that Tennessee Jed? <laughs> 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 you know? 
So, um, and then of course, you know, the, the he's gone in the second set is, is incredible. It's, it's just, and the friend of the devil opening um, a little on a faster pace yeah. than they normally did. Uh, extending that, giving it the second set version, you know, all great stuff. And to me, definitely worthy of uh, an official release. Um, from a selfish standpoint of view, um, uh, I'd love to see 628.88. Um, 628 is my birthday. And mm. um, I attended that show. I think it's the only show I attended on my birthday. Um, and it was great Scarlet Fire, um, uh, soaring Stella Blue in the second set. Just, you know, great show. So I, there's an FM broadcast of it. Uh, um, I guess if you're looking for, you know, shows in 1986, um, you know, it was kind of a tough year for the band, Jerry um, going into the coma in the middle of the year. And, um, right. But for some reason, uh, somehow, some way, he just kind of, you know, really uh, put on an unbelievable heroic performance on July 4th in, in Buffalo. Um, I guess the band, just like we were talking about with Maine, band always seemed to do well in Buffalo. Yeah. And some of that was broadcast um, as Farm Aid on TV. So there is good video of it as well. But um, the second, the beginning of the second set is especially strong, you know, unusual combination. I think it's cold rain and fire, cold, cold, cold rain, snow and fire in the mountain. And then, you know, um, a few, I think wheel, a pre drums wheel is in there and Miracle and Uncle John's band. So mm. um, just, you know, mixing up the set list and everything very well played. Right. So that that to me that's a good one for a release. Um, in '83, um, the Hartford St. Stephen. That's a great show. The the China yeah. Rider and the playing van, the China Doll and the uh, the St. Stephen. All you know, great stuff. And then of course um, Lake Placid on the 17th is another you know fantastic show that that could definitely be released. Um, is there an official release of uh, 9585, the Red Rocks performance? uh no there's not there's summer not. 85 was pretty interesting there's there, there was there was a, the, the the like you said the cryptical bust out the band was was really in fine form uh improv wise i i always the, the, the shows that i had that spring to mind are hershey spac and merriweather um they were great ones yeah there just there was really good soundboards in circulation and they were all really very very powerful you know uh as a younger guy i always kind of fell victim to like oh jerry's voice sounds terrible but like it took me many years to realize that his playing was was sort of next level in that in that in that pre um in the dark era like 80 83 84 85 you're absolutely right about 86 being kind of a challenging year but still having some gem shows and then 87 i i've put on a couple times the the uh the oakland comeback show and it still mm -hmm. makes the hit the hair on the back of my neck stand up. The audience recordings are, uh, oh, yeah. it's it's unbelievable. I mean, it's really really you're in the room. A good the good audience tapes of those are uh, of something else. You're right about. Uh, I, I share your sentiments. At least I did, and uh, when I was first listening to tapes um, about you know Jerry's voice versus his playing during the mid '80s, um, his his voice was a little bit rough. Yeah. Um, but boy, he was just shredding. Yeah. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it's you have to. It, it, there's a, there's a kind of high bar uh, to entry. You know what I mean? Because of that. And uh, but when they were hooked up, it was really something else. I mean, the the, the band that that was a great arrangement of of the great. That was a great version of the Grateful Dead that they fielded every night. The Howard Wiener book put me on to two seventeen seventy nine. That uh, Keith and Donna's last show uh, mm -hmm. that I had never really listened to that much, and it's fantastic. It there's, is. there's busts out in the first set. The plane in the band is sort of like the last, like jazzy Keith influenced psychedelia. You know what I mean? Because the improv changes with Brent. It's a different. There's a different feel to it. Um, and that was sort of a kiss goodbye. I I had, I mean, who knows what happens on the inside and behind closed doors? But I it it seemed to me that they parted on good terms. That he was going off to to uh start a new project they were still rehearsing at front street like he was still very much in the grateful dead fold 
Um, and it was just time for a change for everybody. Uh, so that show to me really does have this kind of like joyful feel rather than sort of this like, oh, everything like is bad. Funeral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's what I thought, you know, like it was it was a bad time, but it turns out maybe maybe not. What are your what are some of your favorite audience recordings? So um, certainly um, 62470, you know, as I was saying before, um, from Port Chester. Great show. Um, the, you know, I guess another show, uh, that I was talking about before Frost 82, um, there's the Rango, um, audience tapes, which are great. Um, and the soundboard's a little bit thin. So I, I think there's a matrix of that, that could make that releasable. Hmm. Um, uh, what other audience tapes? I mean, obviously, you know, eight, six, 71, that's the, the classic, um, uh, that's the hard to handle and um, uh, truck and other one um, that that's just a, a, a great um, audience tape. Um, it has been for a long time. Um, Is that again, the uh, Fillmore East? No, that's the Hollywood Palladium. Oh, right. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eight, six, seventy one. Yeah, right, 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 right. Uh, that's a great audience tape uh, as well. As um, So let's see what else. Um you know, the, 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 I said the November 70 shows from the Capitol theater. Uh, those are, those are great. Not, not as good quality as 624, obviously. Um, and, hmm. I have to think about that a little bit. I, I had, I, I, even going back to my early days of collecting tapes, I was kind of a soundboard snob and it, it has taken me a long time to come around to, uh, enjoying really good there because because there are excellent uh there were people making excellent audience tapes that that just my own ignorance i kind of stuck my nose up at uh yeah. and and you know re-listen in the archive has kind of um turned me on to some of those and it really is sort of an incredible actually that the, the jerry's back show uh is a good example of that where, where the, I, I kind of prefer the audience recording because yeah. you're in the room you know Yep. And the other one, like whenever there's a bust out, like I featured um, the other day was the bust out of St. Stephen at the garden, 10, yeah. 11, 83. And you got to have the audience tape for that. That, that yeah. really gives you the, the effect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's nice. The, the tape we were talking about before nine eighteen eighty seven. 87, I think the dead were using kind of a, a matrix type of system. And that has, you know, that, that, that has a great audience feel to it. Yeah. Um, 9, 18, 87. And I think it's a great starter tape for anyone that wants to get into the dead. That that's a great yeah. show to listen to. That's a great recommendation. That I mean, again, the, the, to contextualize it and to kind of talk about the zeitgeist, like they were on letter, they had been Letterman guests, but they were like you could sense this like middle aged nod of like, oh yeah, the dead are really like this is a real thing, and like that week at the garden must have just been unbelievable. <laughs> you know, it really was. It really the, uh, was. Did Mick Taylor sit in uh, uh, later that on? The, that was the, the year after. That was in 88. Oh, it was? That was 88? Oh, man. Yeah, that, huh. but that was another, like, very long run. And the kind of, you know, I think 87 set the precedent for long runs at, at the Garden after that. I think that was the first time in 87 they did, you know, six shows or something. I saw but, one. Um, I have a little bit of attendance bias because it was on my short list here of uh, 9 18 uh, I saw the band there. That's the only time I saw... The Grateful Dead in that room, um, but I, I'm, I'm, it, it still tickles me to think it was a wreck show. I have a giant mail order stub for it, and they played Althea. It was, it was awesome. Oh, I, we took the train from New Jersey up to the show, and you know, we were kids. There was older guys like, hey, what do you want to hear? And I was like, the wheel. And they fucking played it. <laughs> and the same guy was on our train ride back, and and we high fived. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah uh, there's really like nothing yeah, there's nothing like the grateful dead in new york city you know I, it's um it, it's, oh there's it, so much energy i mean it's it's i mean the garden yes but um the east coast in general i mean it just has that reputation for just being juiced you know yeah um, totally totally yeah. Uh, the Nassau night before Brent three twenty eight ninety uh is one i really enjoy that's the first wait uh mm -hmm. it, it's you know when it seemed to me when they were getting ready to do something special or bust something out or do something out of the ordinary, it was kind of a hodgepodge set the night before, um, yeah. which I kind of like, you know, it's it, 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 and like, it was really well played. They were on a tear then. Um, 
that was a really fun night. The Loose Lucy bust out, uh, which I don't have the date for, unfortunately. I thought we did write that down. I think that's Landover 315. Four three fourteen. He's a three fourteen three fifteen. That gets three fourteen. That's another one of those like the soundboards. You can hear the room going bananas yeah. through the soundboard. Load it. Use, use it. It's my time. Use, use it. It's my time. Um, eight one seventy three. Has that been released? Roosevelt Has Stadium. Not, it, it it could be. Um, it's certainly a very strong show. It's Jerry's birthday. Um, and of course, you know, it's uh, the, the Garcia trifecta. I think it's uh, Dark Star, Eyes, Morning Dew. So what's not to love there? Yeah. Um, so that that's a great one. Um, you know, I would love to also see the night before um, release with that, but I don't think it's in Sandboard. Um, I, I discovered the playing in the band from 731, 73, and it's in. This, it's a second set playing, which was unusual at the time. They usually would close the first set with playing. Yeah. Playing. So they really gave it the treatment in the second set, and it gets out there. And um, Keith is very prominent uh, in the mix on that with his um, Rhodes. Yeah. And um, they really they they go to some great territory. Um, but yeah, eight one is a great great show. Certainly could be released. Uh, will it be released anytime soon? I think they're probably going to take some time off from 73 because it's the 50 year anniversary this year. They yeah. released the big box set here comes sunshine. Um, and then they also released the wake of the flood, uh, anniversary set, which ha- the, that also had, um, a uh, piece of a live show from I think 11, one 73. So I think they're probably going to take a little break from 73 for a year or two before they get to that again. But yeah, yeah eight one is a good one to release. The the uh, along those lines, they did a lot for for Europe seventy two three twenty seven seventy two in uh, in New York City is uh, is a pig pen tour de force. It was a show I was not aware of, and I saw Dark Star do it last spring, and I thought it was an elective set with just one drummer because there's like five, maybe four pig pen set piece songs, mm-hmm. uh, and it's huge. It's a huge night. It's right in that run of. Shows I forget the venue, but it was it was the they left the West Coast, came to New York for a residency for for like seven nights, and then shipped off to Europe. So it was kind of like the the Europe break in shows. Yeah, and, it was the one uh, for Europe. It was the, the Academy of Music in New York. The City. Academy of Music, exactly right, yeah. exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, and there's some great great uh, shows there, and um, the playing in the bands you can really get a feel for where it's going because. You remember um, playing the band was just like a, a very um, quick song in '71, yep. yep. and then when Keith joined the band in, in in the fall. You could see they were starting to stretch it out a little bit, and by those shows at the Academy, it's really getting deep. And then, yeah. they, of course, develop it even more in Europe. Yeah, it it has. I mean, it has all the structure. It, it, you know, so like. Dark Star has the head section and then you can have kind of an elongated jam and then come back to it. But like playing sort of has that same thing where you have these two musical tags, you know, the main 10 section. And -hmm. then they could do that losing time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jerry get on the wah and really like true psychedelic uh, music uh, on the spot, creative composition, which is uh, really exploratory and a lot of fun to to, uh, to dive into. Yeah, that show's great. 32772 is good. And I don't think that's going to come out anytime soon because of the exactly what you're saying about 73 where it's getting hit pretty hard right now. I, I was I love the Grateful Dead podcast and uh it, I, it, it was fascinating to for them to deep dive into all of those shows. I didn't realize um what a monster performance uh, RFK was. I had never really listened to that start to finish and it's huge. Oh, RK seventy three. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was a classic tape I had back in the day, and um, I immediately fell in love with the Here Comes Sunshine and the Eyes of the World. Um, mm. and the Casey Here Comes Sunshine, to me, it's a very unique version because it's the only version I think that Jerry used the wah, uh, the wah wah. Oh, really? Huh. Um, when when he starts the jam, it gets very drifty, and um, I love the effect, and I wish he had done it more. So that version, I love it for that. It may not be as stretched out as. Some of the other ones that people think of, like 10, uh, 12, 19, and some of the others. Sure. But, um, but 6, 10, 73 is a special one because of the use of the Wawa. Um, and then the Eyes of the World, um, it's just, 
everything about it I love the tempo um, and then when they go into the stronger than dirt section it's mm -hmm. just I mean they are just on it yeah those those that era of eyes of the world is uh is really transcendent my my personal favorite uh, is is the the uh the pre-hiatus winterland the one that's in the movie basically 10 17 74 oh yeah yeah 10, 10 19 is the one 10, that's in the movie. oh yeah that that so you know there's a few eyes of the world that are just so special that is one of them um i think the one from great american music hall is also a yeah really special one as well um and then what? Was but, that tape widely circulated? The Great American Music Hall. That I, you know, I when when one from the vault came out, I had never heard of it, and uh, and you know, some of the older heads that I that I was around at the time were like, "Oh yeah, this FM broadcast. We had this back in the day." Was that a well known performance? It was. It um, was okay. It, it, so because of the FM broadcast, it was also um, bootleggers got a hold of it, and so there were records. I believe the name of the record was called "The Dead at the Make Believe." ballroom or something i don't know why that huh. that was it but um yeah you could get that on vinyl um as mm. a bootleg um there were also the fm broadcasts that were circulating so it was, it was I, I don't know if the entire show uh circulated um but you know the, the most of it did circulate and so it was great when it came out as an official release because it was just higher quality than anybody had ever heard before yeah 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 that that um yeah, I mean, still like that's 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 a go to listen for the liner notes are great through the technical details of how they did it. Healy wrote wrote, wrote the uh, the liner notes. Uh, oh, what about Latter Day Grateful Dead? I have I have a, I have a short list of stuff, that, but a lot of it's like attendance bias. I, I got to see a handful of shows in the summer tour of 93. Mm -hmm. um, I think they were playing reasonably well. Then uh, the RFK shows were good. The giant stadium shows were, were pretty good they did a, they did a um music never stopped easy answers one of the nights which mm -hmm. i think is one of the only times there's that famous one from alpine valley where they did music sugary and that's on a dick's picks yes um, they did that yep yeah that and i can't very clever very clever transition that one that yeah that one really works i can't think of another one other than that giants 93 can you uh, where music, you know, segued into something different. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is one from '76. Um, it was a, a, a very seamless transition. I featured it in one of my projects one year. Um, I think it's 10, 15, 76, where music um, slips right into Eyes of the World. Um, oh wow! It's very. You yeah, check it out. It's they, yeah. It's it's one of those things. Like there were a couple times where the segues were amazing. Like the um, Here Comes Sunshine, China Rider from 217.73. That's just, you know, seamless. Yeah. Um, and this is kind of in that category yeah, yeah. of seamlessness, uh, the music into eyes. Well, th so along those lines, and this is probably what wor I'll, I'll finish with. I mean, uh, I, along the lines of like seamless transitions and then official releases, uh, I, I, of course I had Cornell, um, uh, but the tape that I absolutely wore out was seven, eight, 78, uh, from red rocks, mm. everything about that show. I absolutely love the second set is a total monster. And then the encore is amazing. That that it is Saturday night Terrapin. And I think the best version of werewolves. Set piece from the second set uh, hinges around is is really otherworldly. I think that Cornell is a fantastic performance, but that my, my heart and soul rests with seven eight seventy eight. That's that's probably my favorite show. There's something special about that show. Um, you know, kind of like with Vinita. For, you know, first of all, the uh, the venue itself, the yeah. um, just kind of you imagine yourself being there. Yeah. Um, and then you know, kind of what encapsulates the whole feeling for me is that transition from. Um, estimated profit into the other one where Jerry kind of turns on the Wawa again, that's where yep. things kind of, you know, gets smoky and kind of out there. And then Phil just comes in and just hammers the other one. And you can just imagine like Red Rocks just shaking and just, yeah, it's just an incredible moment that again, you can, you can visualize uh, because of the atmosphere. Yeah. A hundred percent. It was, it was, uh, it, yeah. And even as, as a 17 year old, I knew that I recognized there was something singular about that music that they, that they made that night um, yeah. with, with, with all, all the other versions of all those other songs. I, man, I could, I feel like I could probably talk to you for about a week straight about this stuff. That's, that's, 
pretty much all the stuff I have. I, I certainly have got a lot of listening to do from from the shows that you've uh, n- named <laughs> off. I hope to God the re- recording work, this website and everything is all new to me. Uh, it has been a total delight talking to you, Ed. I really, really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for uh, for uh, like, like. Making- Thank you so much, Andrew. I really appreciate being on. Yeah, yeah, you bet. Well, I hope to I hope to meet in person and maybe talk again soon. Take care. Thanks.